Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. A big milestone today, I have finished the construction and testing of my HF transmitter. And today I'll be going through the performance results. Let's check them out. One of the responsibilities that we amateur radio operators have is to not put transmitting equipment on the air that causes harmful interference to other amateur operators, or even worse, causes interference outside the RF spectrum of the ham bands. And that's the main reason I've spent so much time on this project doing testing, in addition to verifying that the end product met the goals that I set when I started. Now, I don't have access to thousands of dollars of laboratory-grade equipment to make these measurements, but even with a modest home electronics lab, there's still plenty I can do to make sure I'm not creating objectionable harm. So let's get over to the bench and make some measurements. This next test I'm going to do is called the CW Keying Waveform Test, and it will examine several things here, one of which is how long it takes the rig to react to that first and second key presses when you're sending CW. The reason that's of interest is most modern rigs, and including my construction, is going to have a slightly different timing pulse for that first uh, CW dit or dot that you're sending, so to speak. It's because I'm switching an antenna relay and the software has to react and I have to run through that state machine that I described in my software episode to get it into the transmit mode. So there's going to be, ten, there's, there tends to be a slight difference between the, those first two dits that you send. The second uh, thing to look at here is the shape of the RF envelope. We're looking at uh, how does the pulse itself look? Uh, in other words, is it more like a pure square wave or is it rounded off with uh, some slope uh, on the rising edge and the trailing edge? And as I understand it, um, that slope is important because you minimize your bandwidth in CW, the more slope that you have there. The, the sharper it is, the wider your spectrum is going to be. And it makes sense because a square wave is a composite of multiple higher frequency sine waves if you think about your, your your mathematics there. And of course you're looking for key clicks. Are there abrupt changes on and off that can make a harsh sounding um, CW signal? So we'll be looking for that. Now, of course, I'm still depending on the ARRL test procedures manual. This one's section 4.7, and I'm following that procedure pretty closely with only two real changes. The first is um, I'm using 80 milliseconds on and 80 milliseconds off for my pulses instead of 20. 20 equals 60 words per minute. Now, <laughs> there's no way on this earth that I can send Morse code that fast. And it also helps me that there's no way on earth that my rig can send code that fast. I just know that the timing just can't work that fast. So I've slowed that down. I've delayed it to 80 milliseconds. And that works out to roughly 15 words per minute. And that's right in the ballpark of my maximum anyway. So that'll work just fine. And then I'm also using 7 megahertz as my test frequency instead of 14.02. That's mostly because my rig's highest power output is on 40 meters as I established in the prior um uh, power output testing. So I want to test this at the maximum power I can produce. As far as the setup goes, I've got the rig connected to the dummy load off screen and in between it uh, is the 40 dB power tap connected to channel 2 on the scope. Channel 1, 10 times probe connected across an NPN switching transistor that's connected to an output of another Arduino that I have here. And what I've configured here is a very simple setup. I wrote uh, some software to generate two uh, pulses and I've got the encoder there that lets me vary the timing of those pulses and then I just press the encoder and it generates the pulse. So the output of the switching transistor goes into the keying input of the rig. So I'm controlling the keying manually that way and I'm powering it off of a battery pack so it's got its own separate power there. So let's take a look at just channel one by itself on the scope. So I'm going to push the encoder and we can take a look at what that pulse looks like. And you can see that there's a very sharp drop off there. And then there's a little bit of rounding when it comes back up again. And that's to be expected. There's some capacitive loading inside the whole circuit, some capacitive loading, of course, in the rig. So it's not going to be a perfect square wave. So you can see I've got the two pulses. They're 80 milliseconds on, 80 milliseconds off. It's exactly what I want. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust the scope to shift that uh, leading edge over one more division so we can see the entire R. RF pulse when I do the next test. All right, I've moved trace one over one division. I've turned on trace two. Let's have a look at the test. 
So a lot of information on screen here as we look at the purple trace, that's the RF pulse. And before I get into slicing and dicing it, just a quick comment, this is after I've done a fair amount of optimization in the software. And one of the big items was that CW engage delay. If you remember from my software episode, I said I started at 50 milliseconds and I wanted to reduce that as much as I could to uh, minimize the delay for that first DIT to get trans transmitted. And I did end, end up reducing it to 15. And you might think, well, that's line to line with the maximum spec for the relay. The relay is spec at 15 milliseconds max to close contacts. Well, there's also a fair amount of delay, anywhere from 10 to 15, maybe up to 20 uh, for the software itself to go through the state machine uh, go through the routine of activating the relay itself and sending out the signals to the SI5351 to turn on the oscillator. So there's a little more delay there and it is, it is repeatable and it's predictable. So this is the best that I can get. This is the fastest I can get. So let's zoom in on this now and take a look at it more closely. So there's about a 34 millisecond delay from the key down to the start of RF power. The first DIT is 67 milliseconds in length. It should be 80, so it's uh, it's off from that standpoint. Um, there's about uh, 20 milliseconds for the first DIT to drop out after the key is released or after it starts to release. Let's talk about the second DIT. It also takes around 34 milliseconds to start, so that's nice that they're they're even. And it's also about 67 milliseconds long, so they're both even. And a lot of rigs will suffer from a really shortened first DIT when you're trying to send two DITs at the same time. But on the uh, disadvantage side, look how long that delay, that space is between them. It's about 97 milliseconds. And so every one of those should be 80 milliseconds. So I've got shorter DITs and longer Short, the dits are shorter, I should say, than they should be, and the space between them is longer than they should be. Now, that's not that great, I would say, if I was trying to make this rig work well with an automatic keyer and have someone on the other end uh, use an automatic decoder. This is not very uniform. But getting back to my use case, I'm an old straight key guy. You're not going to find very high quality code coming off my straight key. So um, this little error here is fine and it's going to work fine for my intended use of this rig. The other thing I want to talk about is let's look at the leading and trailing edge slopes of that pulse. Now there is a nice little ramp there at the beginning we can see and it's rounded off a bit as it gets near maximum. That's really good. That's going to help minimize the bandwidth of the CW transmission. Uh, when it's shutting off, it's a little steeper than that. Uh, it should ideally be the same on both ends and that's a function of the hardware and it's just the way it is right now. So. Um, there's not much I can think of right now to improve that rounding off and slope on the back end. But another key takeaway is look how flat the uh, middle part is. There are no spikes at the beginning or spikes at the end. So there's no key clicks coming through. So that's good. So that should be clean code coming out. This next test that I'm going to run on the rig is called a two-tone IMD test. And I'm looking for intermodulation distortion or IMD frequency products in my transmitted sideband signal. Now, those products are a natural and pretty much an unavoidable side effect in any amplifier. And a hallmark of really good amplifiers is just how low those IMD products are. At the other end of the spectrum, amplifiers with poor IMD typically have poor linearity, meaning the gain of the amp is not a constant multiple of the input signal. And in addition, even with a good amp, if you overdrive it, meaning you put too much input into it, you can push it outside of its linear region uh, into its nonlinear region, and that makes IMD products even worse. Now, it's of special concern here with my rig because I need to know how high I can set my mic gain control and not overdrive the amplifier. So I don't have automatic gain control or more commonly called automatic level control here in this design. All I have is this knob right here and a visual feedback on the power meter bar that's there to give me an idea of just how hard I'm pushing it. Now, this is an important parameter with RF transmitters because high amounts of intermodulation distortion will effectively widen your transmitted signal. And that creates what's called splatter. 
And that's basically interference on other folks who are trying to communicate very close to your transmitter frequency. Essentially, you're making your bandwidth wider when you've got high levels of splatter going on. Now today I'm gonna do a qualitative check for how good my single sideband signal is and get a, at least a quality measure of how good my IMD products are. But I'm also gonna take a stab at trying to quantify those IMD products. But as you'll see here, I really don't have the correct equipment to do that with high accuracy. All right, so let's talk about the setup here a little bit. So the first item is this guy right here. It's an audio two-tone generator that I whipped up from a breadboard and a few junk box parts. It's connected to the microphone input. And on the output, of course, I've got a dummy load connected to the transmitter. And in between it and the transmitter is my RF power tap. That's feeding my new Siglent that I got a few weeks ago. And I'm still playing around with it, still trying to figure it out. But it'll be very useful today. The procedure itself, I'm trying to follow, at least in spirit, it's section 4.5 of the ARRL test procedures manual. I have to make a fair number of exceptions here, not the least of which is I don't have a spectrum analyzer that can go to 100 hertz resolution bandwidth. My homemade SA, which I've used a lot on this channel, just has to sit on the shelf today. Its smallest resolution bandwidth is 30 kilohertz, so it's just not going to work. But... I think the Siglent's going to uh, pinch it just fine here for what I need to learn. Uh, back to that audio two-tone generator. Um, according to the test procedure, the recommended frequencies for the first tone is 700 hertz and the second tone is 1900 hertz. It's not critical that they be spot on. What is critical is that they be at the same power relative to each other and that they don't have a fundamental, I don't have a harmonic, I should say, of their fundamental that overlaps. So you don't want the third harmonic of one to be equal to the fifth harmonic of the second one, for example. So the way I built this circuit, one of them checked out at 730 hertz, and the other one is at 1,754 hertz, give or take a few hertz there. So that's fine. They're definitely not harmonically related, and they're close enough in power, according to some measurements I made, that this should work okay. My test frequency here, I've got the rig set at 7.2 megahertz, and that's because I want to be in, first of all, the single sideband version of one of the amateur bands, or single sideband uh, region, I should say, one of the ham bands, which I am. And 40 meters is the maximum power band for this rig, so I'm, I'm putting the max output through my uh, amplifier stages here. And what I've done is I've turned up the gain on the microphone gain pot to get about 30 watts indicated peak and below power on my meter. And we'll take a look at what the signal looks like here. All right, I'm going to key the transmitter now and we can take a look at it on the scope. And I'm going to freeze it on screen here. There we go. Advantage of having a nice new uh, DSO that has a, a lot of memory in it. Now, let's look at it more closely. I'll just zoom in on it here with a screenshot. So a couple of takeaways from this pattern. The pattern looks correct. It actually looks pretty decent, but there's a couple of uh, observations we can make from the overall linearity. One is the peaks are nice and rounded like sine waves and not flat topped. If they were flat, that would be an indication of nonlinearity, of overdriving the amp, just pushing it outside of its linear region into its nonlinear region. They're not that even uh, across uh, the, the tops from peak to peak to peak. And if I understand correctly, that might be because I don't have my two tones, my two audio tones set to the same power, or it might be that they are, but getting through the crystal filter and other filters in there, that they, they just end up slightly different in power. But either way, that's an observation. Um, probably the most concerning item is look at the crossover. Um, if I understand how to read this correctly, that should be almost a point in an ideal amplifier, meaning uh, when the, the sine wave patterns go to cross the uh, neutral axis there in the middle, there should be almost uh, no uh, width there, should be almost a sharp point. I think that's a visual indication of nonlinearity. Um, don't know where in the stage it might be, but nonetheless, that's not uh, ideal for what we'd expect to see from a, a qualitative examination. All right, I've reset the scope to overlay the FFT function on there, and let me key the transmitter now and take a look at it and try to take a stab at quantifying those IMD products. And like before, I'm going to pause the scope there we go. 
And in fact, uh, I'm going to zoom in again. I took a screenshot at full screen of what this display looks like. So let's see what uh, of it, what's interest of here. So a couple of things. And again, you got to take this with a grain of salt that this is not a super uh, accurate measurement. But it's at least giving more insight into how well this transmitter is working or rather how I'd say not well it's working. So starting with the two tone peaks here, uh, they are off from each other by about 3 dB. And again, that could be imbalance in my audio uh, stage. My audio uh, generator uh, could be an imbalance somewhere in the, fil uh, the filters that are leading to them not being the same. And I suppose if I really dove into this, I could just adjust the powers of one tone relative to the other and kind of balance that out. But nonetheless, let's set that aside. The bigger concern are the third order peaks right here. They're only down about 23 dB from the primary ones. And these peaks here, the fifth order, they're only down about 35 dB from the primaries. Ideally, according to one source that I ran across online, we'd want those at least 40 dB down for the third and 50 dB down for the fifth. Now, that might be for commercial equipment. I really struggled to find a good reference to know what to use here. So that might be pretty strict. But nonetheless, uh, I'm a little concerned uh, about how well the linearity of my rig is working. Again, got to take this with a grain of salt. Don't have the right equipment. Um, if I really had a true spectrum analyzer and all the calibrated setups and knew exactly how to use it, I'd get a better handle on this. But it's pretty clear. I do have some non-linearity -line here, and it might be something I have to address eventually with this transmitter. And the last thing I would say is backing off on the power does help a bit. I ran the test dial down to 10 watts, meaning I just turned the gain on the uh, the mic gain control down until I got to about 10 watts uh, peak envelope power. And the third uh, dropped by, by about 2 dB and the fifth by about 6 dB. Now that is definitely not consistent with the general rule. I would expect more drop off because um, there's like a mathematical relationship to the third to the primary and the fifth to the primary. I wasn't following it, but nonetheless, this test is showing me that I do have some nonlinearity in this design. For this next test, I'm going to try to quantify the suppression of the single side band carrier and the unwanted upper side band. In this case, I'm running the test still at 7.2 megahertz. I'm on the 40 meter band, so I'm looking at how well my crystal filter that I have in this rig, in fact, that's the item I built the entire rig around, how well that filter works to suppress that carrier and the unwanted upper sideband. And I'm going to try to follow the procedure. It's 4.6, section 4.6 in the ARRL um, test procedures manual. And as before, I've got some compromises here. I don't have laboratory grade equipment, but I think I can get pretty close with what I've got set up here. And clearly I'm using SDR console as a way to look at some data here that I'm getting from my AirSpy HF plus. And what I've done is um, I've also inserted more attenuation here. So out of my 40 dB power tap, I've got an additional 20 dB inline attenuator, and then also a 40 dB 43 dB rather total with my step attenuator. So 63 dB of attenuation on top of the 40 dB coming out of that power tap. So do the math. That's a lot of attenuation. I've also modified my two-tone generator to have a single tone. I've shut off the, the, the lower frequency tone. It was the uh, 730 hertz tone. So I just have the 1754 hertz tone. That's still feeding into the transmitter and I've got it set with the gain. So I've got 30 watts of output power showing on my power meter. And what I'll do here in a second, I'll key the transmitter and we can see on screen what the results look like. Then I'll take a screenshot and then take a closer look at the data values that show up there. So so here we go. Here's what the results look like and the measurements are bouncing around quite a bit. But like I say, I'll switch over to a screenshot now so we can take a closer look at what it's telling us. All right, so let's take a look at this data. This peak right here at 7.198246 megahertz, that's 7.2 megahertz minus 1754 hertz. So that's my primary audio tone coming through in the lower sideband. It's at minus 57.8 dBm. Now I'm taking these values with a grain of salt because clearly this is not a calibrated spectrum analyzer, but I think they're going to be pretty close to enough to give me a good judgment here. 
And looking further to the left, we have this peak here at minus 124.2 dBm. That's the second harmonic of the audio tone. Can kind of reject that one. It's not really of interest here. But this guy right here at minus 135.2 dBm, that's the carrier coming through. It's at about 77 dB down from the primary. And then this peak over here at minus 135.9 dBm, that's the unwanted upper side band. It's also about 77 to 78 dB down from the primary. Now one additional test I did here is I took 10 dB out of my step attenuator and what happened was all of these peaks went up by 10 dB, which is a good sign. If these lesser peaks over on the sides here had gone up by more than that, then I would know that I'm getting some IMD from my air spy, meaning I was starting to overdrive it into its nonlinear range. But because they all changed by the amount that I dialed my step attenuator at the input by, then I can, I can at least assume that I'm good here, and I'm certainly good enough to be in the ballpark. So what does this mean? I've got 77 to 78 dB of carrier and upper sideband uh, suppression. Well... That's actually hitting it out of the park, and that makes me a little skeptical of just how accurate the numbers might truly be. But for perspective, I looked up my FT450D, and that is specified by Yezu to have at least 60 dB of suppression for both the carrier and the unwanted sideband. So common sense is telling me I'm probably not that much better than a commercial rig, but I'll take it. These numbers certainly are not showing anything alarming. And one last test before I go on the air with this transmitter, just a subjective test of how well my audio quality sounds like. And I got the same setup I had here for the carrier and unwanted sideband suppression, but I've expanded the view out a bit. And what I'm going to do next is hook up my microphone to the rig and give it a try. So let's see what it sounds like. All right, I plugged in the mic and I've adjusted the mic gain control for a level I think is okay for now. Um, I will have to try this out on air and get some feedback from hams on the other end so I can figure out just how high to set this gain without driving those IND products and start getting into distortion. I also have to modulate my voice because if I start speaking even louder, I think I'm going to get some distortion just from that. That's definitely a disadvantage of this design. But at this point, I think it's good enough to get it on the air and test it out. You probably noticed I was still using my Keithley meter to keep track of the current that the RF preamp was drawing throughout all these tests. And that was for two main reasons. One, of course, just to make sure there was no signs of any thermal runaway when I started pushing the transmitter. And the second, when I was trying to find the optimal setting for the mic gain control, I wanted to make sure that I didn't reach a region where I was driving that amp more than I would for CW mode. So it all checked out fine, and so I did the final solder connection and buttoned it up. Next up, like I said, is to get it on the air and make some contacts. And to do that, I have to interface it with my simple HF receiver. And where I stand with that is I've completed all the hardware modifications. In fact, the HF receiver is even powered and working off the 12 volt power supply in the transmitter, just like I intended. So all the hardware portions are done. I've got the software in debug phase right now. It's working, but it's a little glitchy, and I think I know what the issues are, so I just need to get those ironed out, and it'll be ready to go. So that, along with going through the details of what I did to modify the receiver to make it work in Captain Minion mode between itself and the transmitter, will be subjects of what should be the final episode in this series, along with some reflections on the pluses and minuses, the pros and cons, um, the good and the not so good that came out of building this project. I thank you as always for sticking with me on this lengthy series. I do hope you're still enjoying this material. And until next time, bye for now.